Hello and shalom everybody. We start our formal recording. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, the topic for tonight is going to be about uh, Yom Yerushalayim, in addition to a little bit of Shabbat, in addition to some a little bit of Shabbat, uh, and a freestyle. If there's a Q and A, you want to get them to discuss certain ideas. Most likely, we won't achieve an answer, but the greater the question, the better the answer that awaits. So. We'll start something tonight, and later on maybe we'll, we'll find something out. Um, so the first thing I wanted to actually bring up was Shavuot. Um, it's coming up in the next few days, we've been counting up to it. Total of 49 days will be, that, that'll be in total for it. Um, why we celebrate Shavuot? Shavuot is the giving of the Torah. Um, and it's actually fascinating, we think about it earlier today, is that what other religion celebrates the day, the inception, of their constitution. It's absent, really. If you think about the monotheistic religions, Islam, Christianity, I haven't heard of a day that they necessarily celebrate and dedicate. Um, and uh, for Judaism, um, you actually have this duality because we have a tradition that the Torah is given on the 6th of Sivan, but there are actually three opinions in the Gemara as to when it actually happened. I believe it was the 5th of Sivan, 6th or 7th. And then we end up celebrating two, two days of Shavuot. And generally, why, why do we celebrate two days of Yom Tov? It's because uh, originally it was supposed to be one day of holiday in the land of Israel. But once we were exiled, and when we were exiled, uh, the Gemara has a description as to how we would notify communities outside of Israel as to when the holiday happens, right? So for example, Pesach, which, which we just celebrated, is on the 15th of the month. So when you declare Rosh Chodesh, right, the first day uh, when you see the new moon, um, you have two witnesses that go to the, um, the central head court in Jerusalem. They testify, the head court vets them out and certifies their testimony. And then they, they declare it's Rosh Chodesh, the first of the uh, month. And then from there, <coughs> we have um, an ancient method of where you have bonfires that they lit from city to city. And what happens with fires, they, they rise up and you can see it from a mile away, right? You can see the smoke, etc. Um, and that's how they would notify the other communities that lived in the rest of the Middle East, as far as Iraq. Um, but eventually what happened was we had neighbors um, that didn't like us too much and that we didn't accept them as Jews. Um, they were called the Shomornim, I believe. And the Shomornim, because they weren't accepted as Jews, tried to mess up whatever we were doing. And they were lighting bonfires on different dates of the calendar in order to mess up our transmission of the message to other communities. And what happened was, is that the land of Israel one day was kept, but in the surrounding communities there was a particular doubt that was created. Is it this day or that? Therefore we celebrated two days. But Shavuot is actually an exception to this rule. Why? Because we have another measure as to when we know Shavuot happens. How? What are we doing every night, guys? We're counting the omen. So we know, once we know when Pesach is, right? Even if we have a doubt and we count 49 days, we'll still get to one day that's Shavuot. So the fact that we keep two days of Shavuot through Halakha, we, there's a whole long discussion of it, but we prove that it's not because of doubt that we keep two days. That doubt as in um, which day is it because we lost transmission of the messaging. It's because originally we have an argument as to when the Torah was given. And there's kind of this like, uh, this like contradiction or back and forth that happens. I said in the beginning of the talk that we have a particular day that we know that the Torah was given, right? Like a particular moment in time, we can stamp it. And then on the other hand, there's also a doubt. Which day did it actually happen? So. It's this yin and yang that we constantly live with, is that the Torah is given on this particular day, and then we have a doubt, is it this day or the other? And that speaks to the duality of Torah, right? In times we'll have the black and white, emet, something staring us right in the face, and other times it'll be a completely gray area, which is exactly majority of life. We'll have certain decisions that we need to make. You turn to your buddy, you turn to your wife, you turn to your rabbi, what should I do? And then it's, you know, you're given advice, you're given, some, you're given some form of empathy that 
this is what I would do if I were in you sh your shoes. But at the end of the day, the decision, yes or no, is, is in your hands. So that's the, that's constantly the uh, conflict that we approach every single day with. Um, so that's a little bit of Shavuot. In, in terms of history of it, Shavuot was given three months after Yitzhak Mitzrayim, in the year, right now is 5783, right? The original Hebrew year was 2448, right? It's the same year that we left Egypt. Um, and um, very, very short crash course into Jewish history. We received the Torah, and then we sojourn in the desert for 40 years, and then we enter the land without Moshe. Moshe is buried um, not in Israel. And Yehoshua Binun leads us in. Um, Sefer Yehoshua describes our the conquering of the land, um, the particular lands that the, each tribe got. Um, and then from there, our Jewish, the Jewish history in the land of Israel begins. And here I'm going to be segueing into the very holiday, I would call it, that we celebrate tonight. Um, and our dominion in the land of Israel was actually short-lived, if, if we compare that to the rest of our exile. We've been in exile for at least 2,000 years, and then in between the two temples, we were also in exile. So, in short, the amount of years that we were in exile trumps that of that we were actually living with dominion, doing our own thing, celebrating our Jewish life in the land of Israel. How many uh, years? Say again? How many years in total? So you have... 400, uh, well, it depends. There's the rabbinic sources that we have in the Gemara, and then we have sources, academic sources. But more or less, the range, I would say, would be 400, um, 410 for one temple, 420 for the other, combined. Um, and then you can have the, you add up the years prior to, to the temple being built. So in total, maybe you could say, you know, under 1,500 years, something of the sort. And I could say right now, we're 2,000 years out. Mm -hmm. So again, majority, we've, we've been outside of it. Um, and what I mean that we had this dominion in Israel is that we had a kingdom. Um, and it, it, even though we had a kingdom, we also had different, uh, it eventually split. We had the kingdom based in Yehuda, and then we have the kingdom of Israel. Eventually there was a split that occurred and then the kingdom of Israel, so it was based in the north, and it, it included, I would say, 10 tribes worth. The other kingdom included Yehuda, Binyamin, and some of Levi, the Kohanim. So you had this northern kingdom that had its own campaigns, right? So it would fight its own wars. It would actually declare war, let's say, on Mamlechet Yehuda, the Judean kingdom, where Jerusalem is based, um, and through political trust that it placed in other nations, it got into the wrong battle. Sancheriv, the Assyrians, had exiled them out of the land, and then you had only one kingdom left. And this is the one kingdom that hosted both temples. So... That's a very short, I would say, in terms of Jewish history, a little bit of a scope. Now tonight, what do we celebrate? We celebrate tonight Chavchet Iyar. And Chavchet Iyar is the, re the day that in which we commemorate the reunification of Jerusalem with the Jewish people. And 19 years before that, we had the declaration of the State of Israel in 1948. Um, and on the uh, historical sides of things, um, Jerusalem came back into our hands after the Six Day War, which is June 6, 1967. Um, there, Israel preemptively struck the Egyptians, and then by way of that, the rest of their Arab nations declared war in Israel. Um, and miraculously, we had won in, in six days. And uh, there we have our first moments in which Jews, without fear of their lives, can now return to Jerusalem without bullets being over their head or without being discriminated against under their Muslim rulers. Um, so the topic I wanted to discuss tonight, very, in short, is the precedence that we have of Chav Chet Iyar. We have uh, a trend in uh, Jewish thought that a day that we celebrate consistently has some kind of precedence to it in prior history, right? 
So we, have, for example, the Taniyot. We have Shiva Sarva Tammuz. We recount five different uh, calamities, events that had um, that had fallen upon the Jewish people. In addition to the besiege that uh, the Romans had of Jerusalem, Tet uh, Be'av, right? Tisha Be'av. That has precedence as well in terms of tragedies that the Jewish people had undergone. Um, on the other hand, we also have events that are celebratory. For example, um, based on the Midrash, uh, I, I think it's the Midrash, um, Hanukkah occurs right around what's called the winter solstice. What's the winter solstice? It's the, so, the winter solstice is the shortest day of the year. And there's a Midrash that states that Adam, Adam Arishon, first man, was created, was eventually booted out of Gan Eden, and um, he's living out in this open nature w without this divine revelation that he had back in Gan Eden. And there, he's noticing that the sun is setting earlier and earlier on him. And what does man think when the sun is setting early on him? It's his creator has forgotten about him. It's that he's living out to the wild, and now when the sun sets, not only literally, but also figuratively on him. And then what happens after the winter solstice? What's the next day? Sunset occurs later, right? A few minutes later. Mm -hmm. So the Midrash connects this period of time to a time of celebration. Adam Rishon celebrates the fact that God had not given up on him. That the sun is, again, going to be setting later for him. So that Kivyachol creates the spirit of Hanukkah, of lighting candles, of illuminating during the night, right? You see the parallel here between the sun setting at a later time and us lighting the candles. So tonight, Chav Chetiyar is something that was also celebrated in the past. And what was celebrated? It's known as the day of, um, it's the Yushvo, it's the Yortzeit of Shmuel Navi. Shmuel Navi had lived many, many years ago. Um, he is the prophet that anointed King David. Um, he actually anoints the first king as well, King Shaul. Um, so the Shulchan Aruch, the uh, Jewish code of law, describes that the 28th of the month of Iyar is a fast day, the anniversary of the death of Shmuel Navi. And for many years, where, and Shmuel Navi is buried in Ramot. Ramot is a neighborhood that's uh, on the outskirts of Jerusalem that um, if you ever visited or if you haven't, the next time you do visit, it's uh, a place that feels old. It's, it's a tomb of Shmuel Navi, but there's actually a place where you can step onto part of the roof and the scene that you get of Jerusalem is something, I remember as a 14 year old seeing it, it's, it's something absolutely breathtaking. Um, and you have recorded over the course of history, no history, about, I would say at least 500 years worth, that there were pilgrims that came to Shmuel Navi, this tomb, on Chavchet Yar every year. And they would come spill their hearts. Um, and Shmuel Navi, in particular, how he's connected to prayer is um, his mother, Chana, was barren for many years. And God had answered her. And God had answered her on this condition that if she grants him, if he's if she's granted a son, he's gonna be serving in the temple for his whole life. It's it's complete dedication from within the womb. The Tana promises and God fulfills it for her. And actually an interesting point here, so this essay that I bring the topic from is from uh, one of my very close rabbanim, his name is Rabbi Ari Khan. He's a native New Yorker that made Aliyah many, many, many years ago. Um, and he had put this topic together. And with his research, uh, one of his interesting points is that on Lagba Omer, we go to Meron. Meron is this northern city in Israel. And we go to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's uh, grave. Uh, addition, in addition to that, there's a custom that we uh, have the three-year-old, three-year-old boys have their haircut done there. Um, and a fascinating historical point that's up for debate is that um, there is some record of parents bringing up their children to do the haircuts by Shmuel Navi in Jerusalem. But because Shmuel Navi, that tomb, eventually 
became a Muslim holy site, Jews had to redirect this practice. And where did it go? It went to Lagba Omer. That's something that he suggests here in the essay. Because if we think about it, having it on Lagba Omer is, is as if you're trying to synthesize two things together that may be a little foreign. As opposed to having it after Lagba Omer where we have all these restrictions laid off of us, right? Rabbi Kiva students stop passing away, then we can celebrate it after the fact, after Lag Um A point that he brings up here in the essay is why in particular do we celebrate, commemorate Shmuel Navi? We have many prophets, we have many uh, tombs of uh, the, the greatest people that we can speak about, that we can learn about in Jewish history. Um, they're found throughout Israel, uh, their resting places. So why in particular Shmuel? Um, he quotes here uh, the Gemara in Masechet Zvachim, uh, a pasuk um, in Shmuel, um, and the message that's taken out of it is Shmuel anoints David. What does David do? David lays the grounds, right? Together with Shmuel, they lay the grounds for the eventual building of the, of the temple of Jerusalem. So we see this connection that not only is Shmuel and Avi, like he's buried in Ramot, that's one connection to Jerusalem, but it's also, he's the prophet that allows for the, the blueprints of this Beit HaMikdash, this temple, this resting place for God to be eventually be built. So that's one connection that he has to Jerusalem. In addition to that, um, there's another episode that's recorded in the Torah of Amalek attacking uh, the Jews as they, they had left Egypt, right? And we, we always read the Torah on um, the Shabbat preceding Purim, uh, Shabbat Zachor, that we remember what Amalek had done to us on our way out. When they attacked our weak, they attacked the most vulnerable amongst us, um, and that's what they're known by. That's their that's that's their mode of battle. That's their mode of um, declaring war, not on the Jewish people, but what the Jewish people represent, the messengers of God in, in this world. And you can you couldn't have more of a again, like I said earlier, yin and yang. This this countering force because what did Jerusalem represent, right? Jerusalem represented the resting place for God in this world. That this is, the, this is the place that Jews looked at whenever they had their celebrations, whenever they had their holidays, whenever they needed to bring a sacrifice. This is the place. This is where they connected to God. And even now, we don't have sacrifices. But where do we face? We face Jerusalem three times a day. We haven't forgotten where our prayers are supposed to be, where the heart is. And... Uh, through a whole calculation that he makes here, um, uh, he mentions an interesting point actually about in that battle against Amalek, Moshe uh, is able to stop the sun. He stops the sun from setting. And based on Rashi, he makes a comment, why is he making the, stop, the sun stop? It's because it was Arab Shabbat. And what did Amalek do? What do our greatest enemies know how to do? They know how to pick their battles. They know exactly what we like, what we dislike. The Nazis, what were they intending to do, in addition to annihilating the Jewish people, is to record and document their culture. And you have over the course of um, the Allies discovering these vast documentation that they have, that they wanted to create a museum of the Semites. A museum that these were the Jewish people, and this is where they came from, these are the languages they spoke, this is what they looked like, these were their genetics, etc. So Amalek, again, many generations prior, wanted to, wanted to exactly hit B'nai Israel where it hurts. Erev Shabbat. And specifically into Shabbat. And what Moshe does, again, through by miracle, is that stopping the sun, he prevents Amalek being able to attack Israel B'nai Israel, while, while they're entering Shabbat. And the very date that that was, was, believe it or not, Chavchet Iyar. 
the 28th day of Iyar, which is tonight. Mm -hmm. So we see this constant thread based on the pshat, based on the commentaries, that we have over the course of time this um, God's involvement in our world. And that's what a miracle is, right? A miracle is that God intervenes, and sometimes we say within nature, and things happen, you know, with probability, without probability. And then we see things that were beyond nature, things that we can absolutely not express. There's no logical reason as to why. We can't formulate any kind of pathway. Oh, God did this and that. Something just out of the blue. And we see throughout these events, specifically with Amalek, and uh, we see with the commemoration of Shmuel Navi dedicating his life on this day that we have been doing for at least um, a millennia, and the reunification of Jerusalem on this night shows that there's something going on here, right? Whenever you, for example, whenever you meet a particular individual and they spark something within you, you know something's something special, something's going on. And sometimes we have a difficult time accepting that within, within time. Because within time, it's kind of a self-reflection that you need to do, right? When you see a person and you meet them and they inspire something within you, you, you see something that is outside of yourself. But when it comes to time, and you could say space as well, it's, it's a lesson that you need to pick up from the most mundane details. I'm not sure if you guys have been to Jerusalem, but aside from, let's say, being at the Kotel, which is a religious, spiritual experience, you go throughout the rest of the city, and it's like, ah, you know, there are some, you know, religious people, there are a lot of Haredim that live there, big Rabbanim, there's also regular Israelis that live there all across the spectrum, uh, being religious, secular or not. It's okay, it's Jerusalem, you know, you have buses, you have Palestinians, you have, uh, you have conflicts that go on every day. Great, we, you know, it's, it's the capital for us. Uh, we have the Kotel. But that, that's as far as it goes. And that, to me, is an indication that maybe we're, not, maybe we're not grateful for the things that should be important. You know, we're grateful of, of the small successes that occur in our lives. But we don't have a communal or national sense of celebration. For us to receive Jerusalem back into our hands is something that our grandparents, those that lived prior to the state of Israel, could have never really imagined. Back in Bukhara, Kafkaz, Morocco, in Europe, to regain Jerusalem in our hands is something that Mashiach has to do. Mashiach has to bring the Jews to the land of Israel and rebuild the temple. And it's, there's a sense of it, there's an emet in there. I, I don't disagree with that. But a, a concept that exists in Kabbalah and, I'm sure Rabbi Murray can expand on it a lot more than I, than I can, is sometimes in life, there's an awakening from above and then an awakening from below. All right? And majority of, so the Chagim that we celebrate, the holidays we celebrate in the Torah, Pesach, for example, is the ultimate holiday. That showed God's mighty hand over the Egyptians. He fulfills His promise to the forefathers, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And He shows with all of this might that despite you being the greatest empire in the world, I'm going to crush you under my hands and bring, deliver this enslaved people out of bondage. So that's Atruta de la Tata. That's lightning, that's thunder, that's everything possible that you can imagine in this Lahavdil awesome movie that occurs. But sometimes there's a Atruta de la Tata, an awakening from below. And an awakening from below sometimes is, is led by very special people, very unique-minded visionaries that can see beyond their own lifetimes. And I, like I said in the beginning, we may not get to any answers tonight, but that, that, if anything, is the attribute of a leader. A leader has a vision that goes so far, that's so broad and unique, that it'll exist beyond their lifetime. So they may end their lives with the greatest questions, but they leave their followers, they leave those, they, the, their loved ones with the, earn, with the curiosity and the want to answer it for them. So the Atarota de la Tata, this awakening from below, is this inspiration that leads our movements. Movements within the, with your, your, own, your own Jewish people. 
And we see that in the religious sense, for example, we have Hasidut, um, Chabad is a sect within it, Breslov is a, is a sect within it. And that had, that had formed 250, 300 years ago. And that you can claim, that's Atzurut Tata. It's an awakening from below. It's a new way in which Jews can in, engage with God and with Judaism. And sometimes you can see it in, let's say, the mo most, in not necessarily the most kosher sense. God intervenes in history, in Jewish history, in our lives, in many different avenues. It's just a matter of us visualizing it, accepting it, and seeing where is the best or where is the most positive within it. And what I'm referring to is some people have antagonism, they express their antagonism against the state of Israel. And I, I understand the reasons. The state of Israel, again, established in 1948, um, and it was established by secular Zionists. These, some, some of the Zionists were aware of God, were aware of the Tanakh. They can quote the Tanakh way better than a lot of people that say that they're religious. But they themselves, their ideals were not religious per se. They didn't carry kippot, they didn't celebrate Shabbat, they didn't eat kosher. But they themselves were a vehicle for something that was extraordinary. Whether we say, you know, whether God, quote unquote, ordained it or not. To create a state of Israel out of, out of literally nothing is an accomplishment that, again, our generations upon generations could have never have thought of. For many years, Jews attempted to return to Israel. They were exiled. And they thought, they're yearning. Again, we pray three, ten, three times a day towards Jerusalem. Our ancestry, our roots are from there. The very divisions that we've created, this Ashkenazi, Sephardic, uh, Edot Mizrach, Bukharian, Kafkazi, uh, whatever it is, all of those are expressions of the Galut. Those are all identities that we had picked up as we had spread across the lands. Mm -hmm. But what's the origin? What's the root? The origin, the root, is the land of Israel. We had tribes that existed. We don't know who's, uh, who, which who belongs to which tribe. We all assume that we are Yehudim, Judeans, coming from Judah, Yehuda. But if anything, that's the original conception. Not this, again, I come from this particular country, and that's why I'm separate and different from you. Now, I'm not saying to abolish these customs. If anything, cherish and celebrate them and share them with your brethren. But we always need to remember in the back of our mind that our starting point in our history, in our heritage, is not from the land that our grandparents came from. It's where Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov made their lives based. It's where the tribes had made their lives based. It's where the original conquest had been based. It's when our temples were united uh, collectively. We had celebrated together. That's the original point of our heritage. Little question, but the tribes themselves never actually lived in Israel. Why not? What do you mean? Did they? Of course. There's, so there's, there's the Torah and there's Nevi'im, right? Tanakh. So the Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Nevi'im translates to prophets. So the first book in, in prophets, in that section, is called Yoshua, Joshua. And Joshua leads the conquest of the land of Israel. Moshe passes away, he confers leadership onto Yoshua. No, no, no I'm talking about the, the 12 tribes, the original Oh, so brothers. the, the, tw they the 12 sons, themselves. correct. Right. They all passed in, in the land of uh, Egypt. Right. So they never actually got to see the land. Correct. They never got to see it. But you have their families, wherever. I mean, over, over the course of generations, obviously, the numbers had multiplied. The um, and each one, you know, got their own uh, land. Um, and specifically, let's say, for example, uh, Kohanim, right? Kohanim had their own roles. So it's not just that they didn't even get a piece of land. That's, that's actually within the Torah itself. God says that the Levi'im will not be entitled to particular land, it's because I am their heritage, not the land. And they will be supported by the rest of the tribes. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's about the Shvatim. Um, so, in conclusion of uh, Yom Yerushalayim, um, we see how it is in 2023. In 2023 today, uh, we see a Jerusalem that is being built 
Um, and this building is occurring by our, our hands. God's intervention is within it 24-7. But it's the city that is now producing the greatest light. And what I mean the greatest light is the greatest limut Torah, the um, Torah learning that exists. Um, believe it or not, majority of, let's say, Sephardic Rabbanim, we get our Horaot, instructions, we get our answers from our Rabbanim that, that live in Israel, that live in Jerusalem. That's where Kimitzion Tetzet Torah, we say in Tehilim, that Zion, Jerusalem, will be the place in which the Torah comes out of. So it's not just a big conception here that all oh, the Jews will return to their land, they learn to return to Israel, they return to Jerusalem, but it's also the, the reality of it is that it, it, it's a city that spreads its light, not just the rest of the cities of, of Israel, but just spreads its light to the rest of Jews worldwide. So, on that note, I raise a quick l'chaim for Yom Yerushalayim. Uh, may we see it be fully rebuilt in our days. Amen. And continue to receive the light that it gives us, and to, for us to have our own contribution in it. And the last point I'll make is, again, part of the antagonism is that it's not the time for Mashiach to come yet. That God will decide. And in my own philosophy, I don't deny, God needs to intervene. God will always intervene. God will show us eventually a sign that X, Y, and Z is occurring in front of our eyes. But something needs to be laid first. You can't come to a party and say it's your party, but have nothing set up. You need tables, you need uh, tablecloths, you need a uh, coat rack for, some, for people to put their coats, you need a dance floor to happen. And that's exactly what 2020, today in 5783, our Jewish year, is that every year that goes by, we're laying more and more roots. More and more Jews are being, uh, are, are building there, are living there. Eventually, when Mashiach arrives, Bezrat Hashem, very soon in our days, it's that there will be some material to work with. It's not working from scratch. It's to arrive to the party and say, wow, you guys did so much already. I'm proud of you guys. Let me see how far I can take you to, to make this the ultimate party. So l'chaim to that. Um, I'll transition from that to um, a concept that uh, we hear about a lot about on Shabbat. On Shabbat, we uh, we hear this concept of neshama yitera, um, this extra soul that we receive on Shabbat. Right? Friday afternoon arrives. We're in a different zone mentally. Someone who is spiritually aware is just craving. I want Shabbat to arrive already. And we have different peaks, different intervals that happen across Shabbat, right? Um, we, go in, we go to shul, we come home, we have a beautiful meal with our family, we share stories, we sing. And then Shabbat morning arrives. And it's a different energy altogether. Friday night, Shabbat morning, very different. And when Nishmat Kol Chai happens, there's a, a particular um, spark that occurs. So when we say the words Nishmat Kol Chai, which translates to the, the soul, the souls of all the living beings, that's the moment in which we accept this extra soul, Shabbat morning, that's the peak. And so uh, quickly, I wanted to just go over what does it mean to have an extra soul? Is it as if, you know, I, I get this missing piece that completes me on Shabbat and then it leaves me in my hole as it is and I just get an extra layer as if it's a coat? What does it mean to get an extra soul? So we have, um, uh, I have a book here, it's called HaShabbat. It's written by a Chabad rabbi based in Israel. Um, I actually myself wanted to translate this into English because I had read it a couple of times. And Mamash, beautiful ideas, short, concise, and these are things that are not commonly talked about. Bezat Hashem, another time we could discuss, let's say, he, he goes through Shalom Aleichem, right? Shalom Aleichem, why do we say it? Why do we say it three times? Uh, Havdalah, for example, right? We, we put our fingernails in front of the fire. Why do, we, why do we do that in particular? Why do we smell the besamim? 
all of these like simple questions, like th things that we just understand or we say in Hebrew, Muvan Me'elav, automatically, you know, we just, you know, it's part of the thing. Go with the flow. So this book, uh, it's two volumes, goes through these like basic motions. Why do we do them? What's the spiritual, like sometimes we have an alachic legal um, uh, point to why we do particular things. Some, but other times we should, we, we should get to know what the spiritual end is. What does it happen to my soul? What, what does my soul go through when I go through this special day that God gave us once every seven days? So, Nishamah uh, Yitera, we have Rashi, we have the Ibn Ezra, and we have the Zohar. I'll start off with the Zohar, actually. Um, that uh, he writes here, um, his name is Rabbi Karasik. Azor Omer she Beshabbat Bekabim Neshama Nosefet, Beshabbat Notim Leben Adam Neshama Acheret, Neshama Eliona, Neshama Sheesh Bait Kolash Lemuyot, Bedugmat Haolam Haba, Nefesh Chiunit Nishpat Baolam Beshabbat. So the Zohar suggests that on Shabbat it's as if we're getting a replacement for our soul. It's like we get a premium version of our soul on Shabbat. We have a weekday one, and then we have a Shabbat one. That's what the Zohar says. Uh, and then we have Rashi. Rashi says that um, it's not really an extra soul. What he describes is, is that the current soul that we have, it just goes to an elevated state. It's as if I'm getting something new. But Lahabziel, it's getting a car and I'm, I'm souping up. I'm investing so much in it and it becomes this top grade model. But you just took something that existed and added to it, as opposed to getting something new altogether. He's saying here that on, on Shabbat, it, it's as if your happiness increases, your rest, the quality of your rest increases, the uh, the expansion of your heart. So it's, it's your, the heart receives and the, uh, the heart gives. So those components all become superior on Shabbat. And he continues here, In addition, so the happiness and the quality of rest aspect, it happens, um, he says, your interaction with food and drink on Shabbat is very different. We enjoy the food that our mothers make, that our wives make, that our families make a lot more on Shabbat. And why? He's adding it here. It's like something spiritually happens to us that our experience with food, something else altogether. And once Shabbat ends, that same piece of Osh Sovo, Chala, whatever it is, doesn't taste the same anymore. It's missing that extra whatever it is. Um, and uh, a point here that I actually wanted to uh, bring up is that, uh, I think it's, it's based on the Lubavitcher Rabbi's words, that sometimes we enter Shabbat, I'll put it like this. A lot of the times we make this dichotomy of, I keep Shabbat, I don't keep Shabbat, right? One of the two. And in the direction of, oh, I keep Shabbat, how do you keep Shabbat? There are many ways, right? I can go to shul, I turn off my phone, I don't drive, I don't work. And the Rebbe makes a very particular point here of, oh, I don't work. Physically, maybe you're not doing any work, but where is your mind? Where is your mindfulness when it comes to Shabbat? Are you able to put your finances, the car, the kids' school, are you able to put those things aside in order for your mind to be a vessel for the words of Torah that you'll hear, for the compliments that you'll hear, the stories that you'll hear from your kids and really internalize them. Where is your mind when it comes to Shabbat? And this, is, this draws back to what Rashi was talking about, is that you have the expansion of your heart and you can actually extend the point and say expansion of your mind. Is that can I take the physicality and put it to the side and accept Shabbat and all the spirituality that I can receive on that particular day? 
there is a, it was a rabbi that lived 200 years ago. His name is Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch. He is um, what you can call it the forefather of modern orthodoxy. And in very short, um, uh, modern orthodoxy is um, being engaged in Torah, but also being engaged in this world. It's me wearing a kippah at the workplace. It's me being the Jewish representative in my company, marrying and synthesizing the two worlds. It's taking science and understanding that, and using science to understand Torah, and vice versa, using Torah to understand science, having this crosstalk. So he writes that, um, this is, when I initially read it, uh, until this moment in time, it carries a lot of weight for me. Shabbat is the day, well, I'll go back a little bit. Creation put man on earth, and God had said, man, you, uh, Adam, you, you will be the ruler of all beings on this earth. Humans are at the top of the food chain. And uh, Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch writes that Shabbat is the day in which we exercise the control of not having control. It's saying Shabbat arrives and says, I am relinquishing control over this world. Physicality and materialism is not in my hands. That's six days of the week. Seventh day is when I, I as a human being, take that, relinquish it, and give it back to God. This is yours now. Now, another point about Neshama Yetera is uh, the Ibn Ezra. The Ibn Ezra is uh, a uh, Spanish commentator. Um, he has a great commentary on the Torah itself. He has a very, um, as opposed to being mystical, a very rational, logical approach to, uh, to his commentary on the Torah. And he writes um, very fitting, fittingly that... Uh, Meaning, so it's, it's within the mind and within your intellect. So he's saying here that the added layer that you get with this extra soul, Neshama Yetera, is the ability to learn. It's that you have, your intellect expands and that certain ideas that you couldn't have heard or digested or owned or passed on throughout the week, Shabbat is exactly those 25 hours where God just plants it for you. He says, this garden of ideas, this field, this orchard, these apples, they're yours to pick. Go ahead. As long as you can dedicate the time for it, God says, whatever you couldn't achieve Intellectually, Shabbat will be the day for it. <clears throat> and he goes to the point here that there's... Can you repeat that? I don't think I understood it. So, his point here is that the soul, this added layer, is on the plane of your mind. Right? Rashi, what he, what he was saying is, I get to enjoy physicality a lot more today, right? Food tastes a lot better to me. My sleep is a better quality. Um, my interactions with others becomes a lot easier. The Ibn Ezra is saying this added layer is not one of touch, of physicality. It's one of intellect. It's that I can take a piece of text, I can read a book, I can listen to a shiur, I can engage with someone who has this... Uh, these fascinating ideas but on particular in Shabbat that is the time in which I can understand all of those things and understanding it, it goes through a, understanding is a whole process in and of itself when I hear something it doesn't necessarily mean I understood it right I hear it sometimes I hear it multiple times sometimes I need to read it sometimes I need to write it down um, sometimes uh, it needs to come to a point where I reproduce it from scratch uh, I write it down for myself many hours later. Or sometimes, which is the greatest form of understanding, is when I can take a concept and teach it to others. Right? Teaching something to others is a particular mastery of a subject. So Ibn Ezra says that Shabbat is the particular day. 
And that's why you have, uh, uh, thankfully for Rabbi Mergi and the efforts that we have in our community, the fact that we have a shiur on Shabbat is something uh, extraordinary. It's, a, it's something that you can carry with you throughout your week. It's something that you look forward towards. And it's not just because you get to know something new, it's because your mind is on all levels it, um, are aligned. All of your organs are aligned on Shabbat. That's the, if you synthesize Rashi and Ibn Ezra, these two ideas, is that I get to enjoy not just the food, not, my interac not just my interactions, not just my family, but I get to enjoy my mind to almost full, to full capacity. And that's, that's, if anything, one of the beauties of Shabbat, is that I, as a human being, can reach my peak. Right? A, lot of, a lot of people think that reaching their peak is, could be in physicality. I go to the gym and I work out, which I'm not discounting that. It's obviously an ideal. Um, another one of reaching your peak is earning the most money possible or going on as many vacations. But there's a point that's missed in all of those things. Is that, do I know what the end goal is when I quote unquote make it through all these initiatives, right? The end goal of making a lot of money, the end goal of going on these vacations and working out, all these things. Do I know what the end goal is? And 99% of people in this world don't. Lost, completely lost in those initiatives. And if anything, Shabbat is not just a reminder to us, oh, you know, 25 hours, I need to shut off all those things. It's a reminder that we have something that's actually more important and actually provides us an end goal at, at the end of it. And we're able to put things aside and we're able to focus on ourselves. Again, that's the beauty of Shabbat. Uh, that was the Shema Yatira. Do you guys have any questions, any other big ideas or topics you wanted to talk about? Are there going to be any answers to them today? Or this is a... It depends what kind of questions you have. Again, I'm not a master. <laughs> but uh, if there's uh, something about Jewish history, for example, um, or halakha is not my greatest feature, um, but big concepts we call Machshavit Israel, so um, Jewish thoughts that you have for generations, anything like that. I think those things that you touched base on in terms of Kabbalah and all those things like I've always had questions about them, but right. we've been doing it for years and not knowing for why. Actually, I think those would be pretty good topics. To so we can, uh, I can expand it on a later time, but why we do have Dala very quickly is that there's a Midrash that describes, so Adam is created on the sixth day, right? And uh, according to the Masorah, to, to tradition, the sin occurs within the sixth day before Shabbat occurs. And Adam is allowed to spend Shabbat in Gan Eden, from uh, what I recollect. And then after, after that, he's, he's kicked out. And Gan Eden has these like two planes to them. One is a physical geographic location, and one is a spiritual end. And... On this world, there is. Correct. And uh, he's kicked out. And Adam Rishon is now left in the dark, right? Mutzay Shabbat, pitch black. What we do with Havdalah is that we commemorate God allowing Adam Rishon to discover fire on, sh on Saturday night. That's what we do with the Havdalah candle. We commemorate that. That's one thing. The second thing is besamim, right? We smell. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What, when you say discover, how, where did you discover the fire? Uh, it's. I remember in one line, it's. Um, it was somewhere. It's flint. No, he he strikes stones. Ah, he strikes objects one against another and is able to to reveal a spark. Uh -huh. And based off of that, he's able to create fire. From in, in from Gan Eden. No. Out, outside. Outside of Gan Eden. He's kicked out of Gan Eden. So. So this supposedly there is darkness there, and Correct. he's kind of alone in desolation, and that is the mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so that's for the fire that we light. Um, besamim, uh, besamim is uh, so incense, right? We smell it, and it's supposed to be a strong smell, 
and a smell that we enjoy, right? We can, you know, produce a substance that's very pungent and sharp and call that an incense that we can make a bracha, uh, blessing over. And why we make a besamim is, again, this, all of these points relate back to Adam Rishon, to creation. The one um, faculty of senses that was not affected with uh, the sin, the, as in the punishment of it, was the sense of smell. The sense of smell was the only thing that was retained that we could say is as pure as it was when God created man, Adam. <clears throat> so what we do is actually it's connected to this very idea of Nishama Yitira, this extra soul, is that for 25 hours, we are just at the, at the top of our game, spiritually. God gives us Shabbat, He gives us an added layer. I enjoy my food. I'm able to learn a lot better. Something, a part of me changes. And what happens at the end of those 25 hours? She leaves. Then Neshama leaves. And uh, we actually do two things um, to depart with it, with depart with the soul, with grace and with peace, knowing that it'll come to me next Shabbat. Two things. One is what's called Milava Malka. Having that fourth meal after Shabbat. And Milava Malka is in reference to uh, Shabbat itself, but it also does, mess, does something for the extra soul, right? I said the extra soul enjoys the food. So that fourth meal is as if I am accommodating the queen, the queen of Shabbat, back to her home. Mm -hmm. And it's also accommodating mm -hmm. our extra soul. That's one thing that we do. The second thing is uh, Besamim, like I said, is that sense that it's as pure as it was in creation. That is the alt, is one of the comforts that the soul gets as it is leaving us. It's having the sense of smell that gives us vitality and invigorates us and con, kind of uh, opens the door for the soul to leave and also closes it. And then we have our sense of comfort as we, as we smell it. So we went over the fire, we went over the besamim, and we went over the geffen. Conceptually, right, geffen, wine, is, is, uh, is a beverage that we use for any uh, ritual, right? We go to weddings, chupa, it's wine. Kiddush, it's wine. Um, anything instrumental, we always do with a cup of wine. Um, and wine, wine in particular, I'm sure there are many Kabbalistic spiritual sources for it that you know, we can read about it at a later time, but um, whenever we engage in a ritual act, so it's whether we enter something or exit something, we're always doing it with the wine. We're always being mikadesh. Mikadesh is to sanctify. So we sanctify over this beverage. Um, so those are the three components of uh, the Habdalah candle, the Besamim, and the wine. The one last point I'll mention is that... Um, you'll notice that only on Shabbat do we do this. The meaning, what's say Shabbat, when Shabbat leaves. We don't do this whole procedure for Yom Tov. Mm -hmm. Yom Tov, Pesach, Sukkot, Rosh Hashanah. We don't do these things because those holidays are not days in which we receive an extra soul. It's only Shabbat. So if we don't have that extra soul, what happens? Um, and it's not Shabbat. Uh, the candle is not lit. Why? Because the candle is a commemoration of Motzei Shabbat. Mm -hmm. Right? When Adam Rishon strikes that fire. Mm -hmm. We don't do the candle. And the second thing is, Besamim is again, is the comfort for us that our soul is leaving, that the extra soul is leaving. But it never arrived for Yom Tov anyways. Mm -hmm. So that added layer, we, we don't have any engagement or interaction with it. So that's why it's just wine. So wine is like always. Wine is always, again. You, Why do you look at the fingers? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I don't remember the reason in the text, but I think if we go according to this Midrash, I don't know if reading it or if I just made up in my mind, but the following. What happens when you reflect your fingertips in front of the fire? Right? Out of all body parts, your nails reflect, reflect some light. Mm -hmm. Right? Think about it. No other part of your body, unless you have a watch on, which is not part of your body. Your eyes. I Meaning your eyes receive the light. Well, you could see the light in your eyes also. 
How do you see the light in your eyes? So if you're looking at a fire, I could see the fire in your eyes. I'm not sure what you mean. Do you guys know what he means? So right now, I'm looking at you. I see the reflection of that light in your eyes. You have a reflection of the light. Okay, fine. Let's say eyes. But let's say you're alone. Mm -hmm. So one thing, the one thing that does strike is when you put your fingertips, you're able to reflect something. So there's one thing in being able to strike a fire and there's a second thing, there's a second thing to make use of it. So when I put my fingertips forward, mm -hmm. it's as if I'm able to reflect some light onto something that's peripheral to me. Mm -hmm. That's one idea, conception I had in mind. But an actual written answer I can have for, for this in two days from now, if you want, for Shabbat, we can read together. Sounds good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? I think that's it. We have Shabbat next week. We have cheesecake. Um, I'll most likely be giving a shiur a Shabbat night. We stay up all night. I can give Rabbi Mergi a break. Uh -huh. um, that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you guys for listening. And uh, Bezrat Hashem, may this place bring a lot of light.